everyone to the afternoon session on the future of physics and faith. Uh, we have three speakers for this session, and the first is Charles uh, Kenkelborg, who's going to be telling us about quantum entanglement for non-specialists. Thank you, Robert, and uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here at ASA with all of you. Um, I come to this topic as uh, mainly as a teacher of physics. My, my research involves optical instrumentation and doesn't touch that much on quantum mechanics, although a little bit. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do uh, in the first half of the talk is mainly just talk conceptually about what quantum entanglement is, uh, what it looks like, and then uh, I'll, I'll transition into uh, trying to understand just exactly how strange the predictions of quantum mechanics are. Uh, it'll be necessary to pull in just a little bit of special relativity to, to do that. Um, and so then once your mind is thoroughly blown, like mine, uh, then I'll talk a little about theological impl implications, uh, focusing on the two main features of quantum mechanics, one of them indeterminacy and the other non-locality. Um, as revealed by these entanglement experiments. Around the beginning of the 20th century, it became apparent that light was made of particles, and those were called photons. I'm trying with this visualization to imagine uh, how to picture the phenomenon of polarization. So I have randomly polarized light coming in uh, from a source at the left, and, uh, and those photons all have random orientations to their polarization but uh, half of them pass through the blue polarizer, and those that do pass through, the interesting thing is that they align themselves uh, with that polarizer. And uh, if the two polarizers are aligned, then all of the light makes it through the second polarizer, the, the red one. And, uh, and if you turn the polarizers orthogonal, uh, then you find that none of the light makes it through the second one. So, uh, so this is just a, a sort of schematic picture to help understand both the fact that light is photons and, and that there is polarization. I'm treating it as if individual photons have a definite polarization, and, um, and unfortunately, uh, I'm, gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to give up that assumption later on, but, but for now, I'm going to stick with it. Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of phenomena in nature that produce pairs of, far of particles that are in some way correlated. Uh, and that's the phenomenon that we're going to uh, understand as entanglement in a little while here. But uh, there are relationships between these particles. In this case, uh, two photons are being uh, produced by the annihilation of an electron and a positron. And the two photons are expected to have orthogonal, that is perpendicular polarizations because of this uh, inherent symmetry in the process. And um, now it turns out gamma ray photons such as we get from this, uh, like half an MeV or whatever it is, they are uh, difficult to measure their polarization. So most of the, the really consequential experiments have actually been done with pairs of infrared photons. Um, so let's imagine such an experiment and the process uh, the, represented by the bright flash in the middle is producing two photons. As you can see, they have perpendicular polarizations and I'm just sort of rotating through all the the possibilities of that random polarization, and alternately it becomes uh, easier for either Alice or Bob looking through their respective polarizers to see these photons. Um, and uh, because the two polarizers are parallel at the moment, uh, but the two photons are perpendicular to each other, uh, it's unlikely that both Alice and Bob will see the two photons from any one event. Uh, in fact, that, polar that uh, probability under the simple model that I'm exploring here is only one eighth. Um, if I let Bob rotate his polarizer, then we see lots of other possibilities. Uh, in particular, if Bob's polarizer is perpendicular to Alice's, then there's uh, a three eighths chance that both photons will make it through. Um, and we can summarize those results in a graph here that the heavy line, uh, sort of sinusoidal line there going from left to right, that is the, uh, the result with these, uh, these two polarizers, essentially scanning through the differences in polarizer angle between Alice and Bob. And uh, the dashed line represents what we would have with uncorrelated photon pairs. So these two photons uh, 
really, really don't have the same origin, and, uh, and there's a 50% chance one will make it through, there's a 50% chance the other will make it through, you multiply those two together and you get 25%, that's the, that's the flat line. Uh, now, the picture that I've described so far might be uh, associated with uh, what you might expect based on the old quantum theory. Before about 1925, uh, what happened in 1925 and 26 is that Werner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrodinger mathematically uh, made, made, made uh, quantum mechanics much more rigorous. And, uh, and as a result of that, that new rigorous quantum theory, it quickly became apparent that one should expect much stronger correlations between uh, pairs of entangled particles, such as these two photons we've been talking about. And in fact, the prediction would correspond with this orange line. You see how much stronger that correlation is. It basically says that when you have an angle of zero between the polarizers, you never get both particles through. <laughs> when they're 90 degrees apart, either plus or minus, then uh, there's a 50% there's a chance that they'll both make it through, a 50% chance that neither will make it through, and you never get just one or the other. <laughs> so this strong correlation is what drove Einstein up a wall, and the, the paper that he published with Podolsky and Rosen suggested, this theory is nuts, it can't possibly be how the real universe is. So um, let's, let's see if we can try to understand what the rules are that lead to this strong uh, correlation uh, prediction. And, um, and I've tried to describe it here in a way that's independent of the usual interpretations of quantum mechanics. And so uh, I've, I've come up with my own kind of silly way of imagining it. So pretend that these two photons uh, from the time they're created are connected by a rigid drive shaft. Now it's extensible so they can continue to move away from each other, but they're, they're always held exactly perpendicular to each other. So that when photon A, let's say, encounters a polarizer, it has a 50% chance of going through. If it's transmitted, it assumes the orientation of that polarizer, and photon B immediately locks up and goes, okay, I'm, I'm perpendicular to that. <laughs> and, and if photon A decides not to go through, then it orients itself perpendicular to its polarizer and photon B moves in tandem, <laughs> okay? So that's the strange rule. But then after that first me measurement, both photons have a definite polarization, and beyond that point, the entanglement between them is broken, the drive shaft evaporates, and they go on their separate ways. <laughs> so those are the rules. They're weird rules, and you can start to understand why Einstein thought that this, this correlation between their behavior, even at great distances, because Bob and Alice could be across the room from one another, they could be opposite ends of town or whatever, uh, that really bothered Einstein a lot. <laughs> um, I should add, it doesn't matter which photon is measured first, the statistics come out the same. You can't distinguish those two cases. Um, okay, so now let's imagine that, uh, that we try to come up with a scheme. And this is called a local hidden variable theory, where the two photons, like criminals, try to get their story straight before they're interrogated by the police. <laughs> and so they say, okay, uh, if I encounter Alice's polarizer in any of this range of orientations that I'm going to be transmitted, and you take the opposite set of orientations, and we'll see how well that works. So uh, what this leads to is the ability to actually replicate uh, two points on the graph correctly. Uh, this one here at minus 90, this one here at zero, plus 90 is really the same as minus 90. Um, and, uh, it turns out, however, that it doesn't replicate the whole orange curve. Instead, you get these straight lines going through. And so what you get, considering all possible polarizer orientations, is something intermediate between the old quantum theory locally real picture and the fully entangled picture. So it turns out that this scheme doesn't work as well as thought. That was all formalized in a theorem in 1964 by John Bell. Uh, wherein he, he essentially showed that quantum entanglement is not equivalent to any theory imaginable in which particles interact individually with their own local environments. Instead, there has to be some kind of mysterious connection that persists even over long distances. And that 2022 Nobel Prize last year, uh, won by uh, uh, Aspect and Clauser and Zeilinger, uh, was essentially three independent groups 
doing uh, experiments that demonstrated very clearly that the orange line is really what nature does. <laughs> so, um, and I, I just want to point out, this is now a commonplace. If you have $30,000 that you don't know what to do with, just go to the, uh, go to the Thor Labs catalog and you can buy uh, a widget that will give you 500,000 of these correlated photon pairs every second. So you can have your very own. <laughs> now, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's try to figure out just how weird this is. So what I have is called a space-time diagram. Position is the horizontal axis. Time is the vertical axis. At the bottom is the event generating the two photons. Their slopes uh, represent the speed of light traveling toward Alice and Bob with their respective polarizers. And uh, I can also draw lines for Alice and Bob. They're just standing there, so their lines are vertical. We call these world lines. Now suppose photon A trans tries to communicate to photon B and say, hey, psst, do this. Uh, it sends a message off at the speed of light toward photon B along the red arrow there, and you can see it just has no way of reaching Bob's end station there in time. And likewise, photon B has no hope of influencing photon A at this point, it's too late. So this is why Einstein was so perturbed by all of this. Now, if, uh, if you watch enough science fiction, you might say, well, look, maybe we have instantaneous communication of some sort, right? Maybe the, maybe the message can go straight from right to left or left to right without taking any time. But I contend that even that is problematic in the universe that we live in. And, and here's why. I have to introduce a third observer named Carol. And she is moving from left to right, not at the speed of light, at a much more gradual rate, but according to special relativity, she has a different perception of space-time than we do in her reference frame. And the faint diagonal lines there that are sort of marching from bottom to top, those are surfaces of constant time. So in Carol's reference frame, Bob clearly makes the measurement first. But if Carol were moving the other direction, she would say that Alice clearly makes the measurement first. Okay? <laughs> so, who is supposed to, which, which photon is supposed to tell the other what to do? We don't know which one is measured first because there's no self-consistent sense in which one is first. Neither is first, <laughs> okay? That's just a fact of special relativity and quite demonstrable experimentally, by the way. So, uh, huh, all right, <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> Well, let's talk about the interpretations that have been offered for quantum mechanics and how they speak to entanglement. The standard Copenhagen interpretation that I was taught and that every physics student is taught uh, says entangled photons share a superposition state. And it's a state of indeterminate polarization, in other words, uh, before measurement. But measurement somehow causes wave function collapse. That is, the photons suddenly assume both of them a, a definite polarization in response to the measurement. The Copenhagen interpretation doesn't say how this happens. It's just, you know, this is what you do to do the calculation and it will tell you what the results are and what statistics to predict from the experiment. Um, the de Broglie-Bohm theory was an attempt to make a deterministic theory that uh, accounts for all this and the way it does it it assumes that the photon pair had definite polarizations all along. Uh, we just didn't know what they were until they were measured. And there's a, a postulated auxiliary equation of motion that not predictively, but only retrospectively tells you, well, here's what must have happened to lead them to do this. It's a non-local theory in that it requires instantaneous communication at a distance, uh, but it's not, uh, doesn't have to be causal one direction or the other, exactly. Um, so that's de Broglie-Bohm. There's also the many worlds interpretation, which is like Copenhagen, except that we suppose that when there's a measurement, suddenly there are now, for, henceforth, two universes, one in which photon A was transmitted by the polarizer, one in which it was absorbed. And so every time there's a measurement, we get more universes. Then there is the superdeterminism interpretation. This is kind of the most radical in which Alice and Bob and the photons and every particle in the universe are just following a detailed script that was written at the beginning that specifies all the measurements that are gonna happen and what their outcomes are supposed to be. So every 
electron, every photon, is dragging around a copy of this script and reading to see what it's supposed to do next. But somehow, we're not allowed to read ahead. Um, so uh, all of these are problematic in one way or another. Uh, Copenhagen doesn't offer an explanation. De Broglie-Bohm offers untestable dynamics. We don't usually like physics equations that we can't test. Uh, many worlds has an exponential proliferation of the number of universes, and superdeterminism has this enormous script that everybody has to drag around. So I don't know how you apply Occam's razor to this, <laughs> but what's for sure is that we don't have an experimental way of telling the difference because all of these make the same predictions. <laughs> So what are the implications for the kind of universe that we live in? Well, first of all, uh, I've pointed out that nearly simultaneous measurements can't be causally connected. That is, we can't even say which one occurs first. Nevertheless, there's this mechanism, experimentally verified, called entanglement, that coordinates the otherwise random outcomes uh, at two very different locations that can be widely separated. And experimentally, this now extends above 1,000 kilometers, by the way. Um, so our universe is non-local in character. Uh, you might ask, well, does the freedom of random outcomes then reside in photon A or photon B? Who gets to choose? I think we can't, we can't pick one or the other. We have to say it's either both or it's neither. If it's both, then A and B share the, f the freedom to map out their future. Uh, that's more like the Copenhagen interpretation. Or under the de Broglie-Bohm interpretation, you might say neither is free. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a deterministic process that somehow underlies the quantum theory, but is non-local. So uh, now, how do we think about this as Christians? Uh, gosh, I don't know. but. Uh, <laughs> One thing that's clear is that many, are, but not all, outcomes in our universe are unpredictable uh, based on anything you can do with the experiment set up or any prior measurements. The common question that's asked is, is the randomness ontological, that is, it just really fundamentally is random, or is it epistemological, i.e., like de Broglie-Bohm, we just don't know uh, the thing that is actually determined. Uh, and there's no experiment that can tell us the difference between these. So I would like to somewhat uh, take a step back toward humility and say, what if we call it crypto-random? We just acknowledge that quantum indeterminacy is something that is humanly inscrutable. There's no experiment we can think of, at least so far, that would help us to distinguish between these possibilities. I would also uh, offer that indeterminacy does not have to detract either from God's sovereignty nor from human freedom. And in, and in fact, indeterminacy is really good for us because if you think about it, we experience subjectively in the present moment freedom and we exercise responsibility and we learn from our past, but we're not burdened by the future. I think that's a good thing. I think that's God's gift to us. Then as far as this non-locality thing goes, uh, regardless of interpretation, particles at great distances can be part of a single entangled quantum state. Maybe that's saying that being is intertwined with relationship. This sounds very much like relational theology to me. And, uh, and I, would, I, would, I would suggest that that broad category of theologies may have something very useful to say to us about how God chose to put this universe together and why God would like it that way. Um, also, like quantum mechanics, theology has uh, many battles that are difficult to fight. Um, you know, if you think of free will versus predestination, right? Uh, how do we decide between those when both concepts have compelling bi biblical support, or at least, at least many of us think they do? Uh, well, there, maybe, maybe a way to think about this is by the analogy with entanglement, to conceptualize that there could be a relationship between the divine will and human freedom such that God's plan of salvation unfolds regardless of our free choices and in a way cooperating with our free choices. So if I were to sum that up in a few words, I'd say God has chosen to be entangled with the creation. How about that? 
So with that, I'm open for questions. Uh, would you say that adding extra dimensions could potentially offer a solution of some kind? Well, a solution to what? <laughs> How to go from one point to another without appearing to go through the, the, the universe we know. Yeah, well, you know, I suppose there, there are any number of possible ways that a person might conceptualize, let's say, this instantaneous apparent transfer of information between uh, the two particles. One of the interesting and strange things, though, is that there appears to be no way to exploit this uh, for our own handy communication. Uh, that appears to be strictly outlawed by the rules. So it's as if the universe is trying to enforce upon us this speed limit light, or this light speed limit, but, uh, but the subatomic particles actually get to break the law. I, I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> okay, we, we have another question over here. One time I was in a meeting with Mary Gelman and I asked him, uh, what is free will? Uh, and he was kind of stumped, and he eventually said, well, have something to do with quantum fluctuations, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a really important talk and, and an important idea. It, it is so fundamental, it, it seems to me that it could become really a basis for a, 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 a kind of philosophical mm. uh, kind of basis for development of some of these mysteries that we accept in our faith. Yeah, you know, I've, I've recently been reading a book by William Lane Craig, um, and the title's escaping me, but it's essentially his pre presentation of Molinism for like, for like people who aren't philosophers like me. And, uh, and I really, I have to say, I struggle with how one defines free will. Uh, I, I, I sort of, I like the idea that random processes appear to have a component that is uncaused, as if they had the cause within themselves. But I think that that's in no way definitive. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Ray from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Oh, wow. And long I'm currently, way. yeah, it's a long journey. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD, and I am coming from the science education box. I am focusing on anthroposophy or spiritual science with Dr. Steiner. And it is a school of thought back in Germany 100 years ago that says it is the spiritual realm, which is non-material in nature, that caused or gave rise to this measurable atomic physical uh, universe. So from the quantum lens, from your perspective in the physics world, so how do you reconcile that idea? Because it appears to me that different windows, but looking at the same thing. Uh -huh. So thank you. Yeah, I guess all... All I can say, I mean, I'm not a theologian, but um, as a physicist who's a Christian, I look at the things that we study, and I, I, I think it's beyond me to, uh, to go into metaphysics, but I feel as though when I look at the universe, I at least see something of, of God's intent. I think that God made it the way that God made it for reasons, and I like to try to understand what those reasons are. And, and you know, particularly with this talk, what I'm trying to do is get past this list of strange interpretations for quantum mechanics and say, well, okay, given the experimental realities, uh, what do I think God is like? And, and I think this, for me, this notion that God might entangle his will with ours, in other words, delegate to us some degree of freedom while retaining complete sovereignty over the universe, I, I feel that there's... I don't know, there's maybe some power to offer in that picture. Uh, I wanted to make a comment, but we might be able to take one more question. The comment is that uh, it's an ongoing active area of research to try and understand what it means for a system to be quantum or not quantum. And entanglement is one feature, but there are a number of other features, for example, quantum discord or Wigner negativity and a number of others that people are studying. And the picture is rather unclear. Uh, sometimes a system is classical in one way, but quantum in another way. And so uh, the jury is still out on this issue. If there is one more quick question, we can take it. Okay, well, if not, let's thank Charles for a wonderful